Hi, everybody, and welcome to Weight Loss Wednesday, Episode 66. I'm Chef AJ, the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, and this is where I answer your questions about healthy, permanent, and sustainable weight loss. And the best way to submit a question is through my website at www.eatunprocessed.com. So before we get to your questions, I thought I would show you a recipe. This is the eight quart instant pot. It's my absolute favorite. If you don't have an instant pot yet, I recommend the eight quart over all the sizes. The three quart is my second favorite size. And if you go to the company's website, which is instantpot.com, you can get $10 off. Now, many years ago, it was $50 off. It's not $50 off anymore because they've lowered their prices. But you can also get the instant pot on Amazon. I've seen it at Costco and Walmart and even Ralph's, which is our Kroger-like supermarket and uh, Target and Kohl's, so you can get it pretty much everywhere now. They are a must-have for healthy living and healthy eating. So what I'm going to do is, you can see that I really do use this book, Unprocessed, and if you don't have it, consider getting it because they're really good recipes. They're great recipes to transition kids and family. There's over 40 dessert recipes, sweetened with the fruit, the whole fruit, nothing but the fruit. And over 50 of them, that's over 50% of the recipes, are completely compatible with the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. They don't contain any nuts or seeds or avocado or added fat. And the cookbook is, of course, vegan and SOS-free and flour-free as well. So today, if you want to follow along, we are going to do the Stompin' at the Savoy Cabbage Soup on page 136. But what I thought I would do is convert it to the Instant Pot, which I haven't done before, but I'm pretty sure I can figure out how to do that. And it's a lot easier because it doesn't take any time, and I'm not going to cut anything up because I live next door to Trader Joe's and I've got everything already prepped. Now, Savoy cabbage is a little bit different than regular cabbage. It almost looks like romaine, and it tastes completely different. I mean, you could use regular cabbage, but this is... Um, it's milder. It's got a unique flavor. You could use Napa if you can't find it, but we're going to use the Savoy cabbage, and that tells the name Stumpin' at the Savoy. That was a song by, I believe it was Louis Armstrong, but we're going to use the Savoy cabbage. But when I use any type of greens in my pressure cooker, I add them when it's done, whether it's arugula or kale, because I like them al dente. I don't like them just mushed. And so I'm not going to put this in until after it comes up to pressure. And I'm going to finish the recipe adding this and my vinegar. So in the Instant Pot, I already have my water. Again, this is the Stompin' at the Savoy Cabbage Soup on page 136 of Unprocessed. I'm going to add my Muir Glen. I use the Fire Roasted salt-free sun-dried tomatoes. You can get these at many of the natural food stores, even regular grocery stores, and really good prices online at places like Vitacost and, uh, and Thrive Market. So I prefer the Fire Roasted. They have a little bit more flavor. These are BPA-free cans. If you're not comfortable using cans, just use. They have uh, jarred tomatoes or use fresh, but these have a really nice flavor, especially when we're not using salt. So I'm going to just dump these in. Nice and easy peasy, lemon squeezy. I'm just going to use my already cut up mushrooms because it's so much easier and I don't have a lot of time. I do three broadcasts on Wednesday and I just don't have a lot of time for chopping. I'm going to add my onion again, already chopped up, which makes it so easy. I'm going to add my celery and carrot and Trader Joe's sells, a Whole Foods sells this as well. It's called Muir, Mirepoix. I used to speak French. I should know that. And so this is just actually the perfect amount for the recipe. So I'm just going to dump that in. Boom, boom, boom. And then my tomato paste and fresh garlic and my seasoning. If you've ever watched even one demo with me, you know that I always measure my seasonings in advance before and I smell them just to be sure since this isn't labeled because it's just so much easier. And we are actually going to revise and do an, a revised edition of Unprocessed uh, when my next book comes out. So because I'm thinking of adding some other seasonings to this recipe. So I'm going to take this in the kitchen to cook it because there's just not, elect not enough electricity out here. But when it's done, I'm going to come back out and show you how it is. In the meantime, I have John Pierre back from Colorado to answer your questions because so many of them today are about exercise. So please welcome to the living room studio, John Pierre. All right. And you can move that table. And Eden is still here. Eden's here. All right. Can everybody see me? Yeah. Okay. So let's go to questions. How long is a normal time to be extremely sore, pain without with any movement from weight training? 
Ah, well, one, it depends if you got hurt. So hopefully you didn't get hurt. But that all depends on the health of your system and how efficient you are at excreting things like lactic acid and things like that. So normally it's just a couple days. Uh, but if you haven't exercised in a long time and you've done new exercises or you've done a lot of eccentric training, so a lot of lowering exercises where you're going into a squat maybe super, super, super slow, that's going to tax your system more and there's more damage to the tissue, so it might take longer. But normally it's just two or three days. As long I got nothing to do here, so I may as well spin. Good, spin, but move that cart, move that. Okay. Maybe you could give me some tips on the spin bike. So are you supposed to be sore when you exercise? Is that true? Um, you don't say it, no pain, no, no pain? No, not at all. Some people are sore, some are not. It all depends on the health of your system. And if, if, it's, if you're new to exercise, most likely you'll always be sore. But as you get fitter, then your system, you're not as sore. Is spinning good? I love spinning. Spinning is good, but the one thing you need to add to spinning, and mm -hmm. maybe Eden can get it, is if we can get a set of hand weights, uh, and, a set of hand weights and an exercise right band. And there's bands over can there. Can you bring that to us? And then I'll so, show you some things because one of the challenges is this forward flexion again that we're doing all I the just, time in life. I just stand, well, that's better. I but, like to stand the whole well, time. Well, that's good. The danger of not not necessarily the danger, but the challenge with standing is a lot of times if the fat pads on your feet have started to to lessen and you're always putting pressure on there, you have to be careful you don't get literally like a bone bruise or an aroma. Possibly. Haven't so had it in four years. Now, hopefully what? all your fat is on your feet. That's right. <laughs> Eden, could you get us a pair of hand weights and an well, exercise she's standing, band? so I don't know how she'll... Well, you can still I'll show her. Them. I'm going to have I'm gonna So, have JP, sit. what is the best form? So, when I'm standing, should I be completely straight? Should I be um, leaning no, forward? Well, I mean, it doesn't. if you're like that for a short amount of time, it's okay, but you want to do it prolonged. But being erect like this is perfect because it's the same thing as if you were on a stair stepper machine. What muscles am I using spinning, it's, standing versus sitting? Well, you're really, you know, here's where you're getting your hip flexors really going. When more. I'm sitting. Yeah, you activate your core now when you stand. I'll take those. So is it good to kind of maybe do a little of each? Yeah, a little bit of each. But the, the nice thing is this is going to be more intense generally all around. Then when you sit down, go ahead. Now, what about this number? Like I wouldn't how, worry about those okay. numbers. Then you, now you're sitting and supposedly recovering, so you think it's easier. But this is when you're throwing in your upper body. So your lower body is recovering a little bit. But you're really hitting your upper body. Nice. Yep. And so then you can go to some military so presses. These are five pounds. Yeah, those are a little heavy. Four. Like, those <laughs> are heavy. My four pounds are in the bathroom. Yeah, so those are heavy. Wow. And then all of a sudden now your lower body's recovering, then you take the weights away, and then you can go back to standing for a little bit. And there's some so bands. Would you want the bands? Sure. Yeah. It's interval training. So basically you're doing something really hard. And then you're resting something really hard now, and resting. Is there is there benefit to like doing a lower intensity and going fast versus getting up to twenty to twenty four and then well, I mean, your body's, re it's, it's easier, so you're recovering now. It depends what your goal is. My I, goal I, is anti-anxiety. That's anti my goal. So, yeah. So, well, you want to be able to do it a fairly long time. So, I spin for 90 minutes right. every other so day. So, that's why you should fluctuate. So, high, low, high, low. That's fine. Cool. So, let me just get an exercise band. There's one on the door there, and oh. I'll show you. Um, you know, I thought if I got this, I wouldn't use it, but I want to spin more because yeah. it's right here. Right, right. So, a lot of you guys asked me questions last week. And emailed me. So the best place to get a spin bike is wherever you can get the best one that you can afford. This is the Kaiser. It's about a year old. And they usually go for the cheapest I've ever seen one without the console. It's about fourteen hundred and twenty-five dollars, and I've seen them over two thousand. I paid five eighty for this on Craigslist. My recommendation is you get it somewhere where you can see it. Mm -hmm. You know, eBay you can only see a picture. So if you live in LA, the guy that got me this. He specializes in getting exercise equipment that's gently used every kind. He had everything in his house. Nice. Okay, yeah. let's have you sit back down. So you can actually attach these bands. You have to play around. Now you can go ahead and do a, a curl. So you, you would actually just do a curl. Let's keep it around here just for now. And then you curl. And then come out. We'd have to actually just wrap this around so it's a little tight. Why don't you wrap it around one time? Well, we can't. It just takes a little time. Okay, well, that's okay. Well, they like to see these things. Oh, that's a great idea. So now she can do her, this is hard. Oh, yeah. But So now you can do your curl. You can also do your rows. Oh, yeah. rows I can do. So rows would be the one thing that, uh, that AJ would be a little bit weaker in is her back. So that we'd want to focus on definitely doing more rows. And then you're still you're still going at a nice pace here, but you're really hitting your upper body. This is great. Yeah. This is a little bit hard. Yeah, that's a little hard, but this is a red band. And what if uh, you need a little less of a band, you I know, see. a thinner one, be fine. So there's a million things you can do on the bike, but you shouldn't just – be doing, you know, pedaling unless you're trying to be a professional biker and you don't want any size or muscle here. You want everything in your legs. But to be all around fitness, we definitely want to add everything. That's excellent. Yeah. So next questions because I know we probably have a ton. 
So, what are the best exercises for a shoulder impingement? Mm, well, first of all, what by, by that person saying they have an impingement, I'm hoping they got diagnosed with an I mean, I'm not hoping, but I'm assuming yeah. they got diagnosed with an impingement. If that was the case, then their either chiropractor or physical therapist should have given them the exercises. So they probably did a lot of retraction stuff. They probably laid, laid on a foam roller and opened up. They probably did a lot of these different stretches. So I would follow what your PT suggests. But one thing I would say is that one thing that we don't do enough of in our life is our hands rarely ever go above our head. And rarely do they do 360 degrees. So hopefully if you don't have an injury, you want to start doing that on a regular basis. Because that, that's a ball and saucer. It's not really a socket joint. It's a ball and saucer joint. It's designed to go in all these different directions. And you want to work the flexibility and you want to work those muscles. So to prevent an impingement, that would be good. But I don't want to comment on the impingement because I'm not a PT, but I would just follow the advice of the PT. When I'm on the spin bike, I do a lot of this. Actually. Yeah, that's good. I, that's I smart. Do, not, not when I'm standing, though. That right, right. Um, Sherry Patterson wants you to show. <laughs> do not say this. No. Um, asks if you could show a couple exercises for when you're in a chair. Sure. So some of them we showed already. When AJ's sitting, obviously you can still do curls. You still can do military presses. If somebody can hold a band for you, then you still can do curls this way, which activates your core a little bit more, right? You still, I mean, every exercise, if, if you want to give me the band, this one, if you can't see, you, so you're in a chair, let's say, for instance, and you have your exercise band, you still can work your chest, even though you can't do a push-up, let's say because you're in a chair, that's fine. I work with lots of people in wheelchairs all the time. Thank you. So we would just take our exercise band, and instead of doing a bench press or a push-up, we just put the exercise band behind our back this way, and then we're just gonna still do a push-up this way. So you're still doing same thing like a push-up, you're still working your chest. You can still take the band in front of you for your upper back and open, but keep your arms straight and locked out, open and close. And what I like about these TheraBands is this particular, the CLX, is they have handles kind of hidden in here. Can you so these buy are, these on your website? Yeah, there's a link on my site, uh, livingwithharmony.org. All the products that I use personally are on that site. So I hope that helps. Uh, next one. JP, about two weeks ago, I hurt my back and neck. What are your thoughts on a chiropractor aligning back and cracking neck? If it's Dr. Goldhammer, yeah, I say yes. Right, sure. But, Somebody who's highly trained, right? And, and next, they they actually make uh, they have chiropractors who are specialists just in the neck because it's its own science. So you do have to be really careful with the neck. But yeah, that's what chiropractors are. That, that's what they do. But they you know who else is good is uh, there's a type of doctor. And if you live in California, we have an orthopedic group called SCOE, Southern California Orthopedic Institute, where every doctor literally, like when I ruptured a tendon, all he did was fingers and one guy oh, wow. all he does is ankles yeah. and so there is there's a type of doctor called a physiatrist not yeah. a psychiatrist and they uh, work with non-surgical mm -hmm. methods of healing and some of the things I've learned from them because I was in a very bad car accident with my neck and just something simple like he took a towel and he took a piece of, of rope and like I hang it over my door and I can do traction just mm -hmm. and he taught me lots of exercises so I love chiropractors too but I'm just saying, you know, go to a doctor too. Like well, that. Yeah, just be careful with anything with the neck, though, because yeah. getting neck adjustments can be problematic. And don't go on rides. That's <laughs> on rides. I, well, rides like at Disneyland. Oh, I always right. do that. I always say I'm never going to do this again. And every time I go to like, I don't mean like a ride like like Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean like roller coaster rides right, or right. Indiana Jones. And every time I say I'm never going to do that again, and then I'm oh. and then I do that again. Why do I do that? That's what people do with the food, too. They say, I'm never going to yeah, do that again. I do it. They do it. We forget. Okay. Um, for building muscle and toning, how many times a week should one do weight training? Is two times a week enough? Okay. Well, I mean, all those questions, those are great questions. It just depends on your build and your age, how much testosterone you have. How much do I have? How much testosterone do I have? Well, as you get, you know, into your 40s, you're definitely starting to lose testosterone oh, for sure. You're in your 40s, right? Yeah, I'm, I, need, yeah. I want more testosterone. Yeah, well, there's ways we can raise it naturally, but one of the things is it also depends how much weight you're actually using, or I should say resistance, um, to build muscle. Because if you're doing really light weights and you're strong, you're not going to really build a lot of muscle. You'll build endurance and get some good blood supply. But you need to use heavier resistance. So I would say on the minimal, if you're trying to gain muscle and become stronger, the minimal you should do is twice a week. But I'd love to see you do three times a week. So like, would it be good for somebody like me to spin every other day and do weights every other day or do that Absolutely. on the same day? So better, well, 
if you, you if it depends if you if you had a spinning you do 90 minutes though. I do 90 minutes and then every what other do you day. Do the next day um I don't do any right. aerobics but I'm always walking so what I would do is if she does her 90 minutes and she does weight training then the next day would be recovery day with more yoga foam rolling yeah, do, do stretching yoga. things like that you could do a little bit more core workout that you wouldn't necessarily be mm -hmm. doing here so yeah mix it up okay um is there a basic set JP recommends for total weight newbie for must meet she must mean weightlifting Wait, newbie, the weightlifting. Could they hire you through Skype or FaceTime? Yeah, I do that all the time. Uh, to, sure, because these are great questions, but it's specific. It's it's kind of like saying, you know, like if you go to the doctor and they in, and you ask them, well, I want to take an antibiotic for this. It really depends what type of infection, what you're treating. It depends your size, your age, your mental capacity. You know, if you've had any injuries. But is there any particular? What was it? A set? Um, I'm not sure what they mean by that, but maybe she means a weight set, a specific. May, either I don't she know, means a, the set that you buy. I'm thinking that either she means like a set that you buy, or maybe like a set like doing, you know, forty oh, right. biceps and forty well, triceps. I think I think honestly, the best investment you can make instead of buying weights, because your body doesn't care what type of resistance it has. There's actually machines that have air. There's machines that have water. There's machines that have weight. There's machines that have bands. Body doesn't care as long as it's getting resistance. So I think the best bang for your buck is exercise bands because they don't cost much and they can fit anywhere they're like. Yeah. So, but there is an interesting um, company, it's called Power Blocks, and they make these weight sets that it's a selectorized pin. So if you lift it up, it's 40 pounds. You put it back in, move the pin, it's 35 and it's 30. Those are pretty good because they're compact. I'm not sure what the question was, but hopefully that answered it. Um, if you're watching, please clarify. Any stretches for hamstrings that act up due to piriformis? I do. A well, the piriformis is. You I know. do this stretch here. You know. She, yeah, that's a good one. She said the pain goes all the way to the knee. Is it best to stretch before or after workout, or both? Both. All the above. Yes, but the best thing is to stop sitting because that's when the hamstrings tighten up. The reason why we have chronic. One of the reasons we have chronic hamstring tightness because we're always sitting, so we're not moving enough. Mm -hmm. So get get out of that chair as much as possible. But uh, better than stretching, maybe not better, but in conjunction is using a foam roller. So you're putting your hamstring actually on here, and then you're actually I heard rolling. I this it. was good for well for your quadricep. Oh, yeah, that's your, not good the for your hamstring. The one you showed for your hamstring was, was decent. Yeah. The piriformis is though often what happens is a tiny little muscle in the butt. A lot of times the sciatic nerve goes through that area, and when that muscle piriformis kind of spasms or tightens up, it puts pressure on the sciatic nerve and then that can lead from pain from your butt all the way to your toe. So it has to be diagnosed properly. But the traditional piriformis stretch is when you're laying on the ground crossing your Figure leg. Figure four, like, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like this, I can do it in the chair. We do it in yin yoga. Yeah. And then you put your hands here. Absolutely, that's perfect. But you just do that laying down, so that's it. And that stretches the piriformis really well. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. But the main thing would be get out of your chair as much as possible. Every time you're watching TV and the commercials come on, then just get on the floor and use your foam roller a little bit. You can also take a tennis ball when you're laying on the floor and put that on your hamstring area. In just about a second, an inch, you move that ball. That would really help, too. Cool. Um, what are your thoughts on working out on an empty stomach? Mm. Um, most, most of the people that I work with do that. But I, ha I have to admit, I have some, some people that I know, some actual friends, that can't work out unless they have a big meal. Really? I myself find that very odd. But working mm -hmm. out an empty stomach is perfectly fine. I can't work out if I have any food in my exactly. stomach. I can't do anything. Yeah. I can't even take a walk. Yeah, I would say just to make sure you're, you're adequately hydrated. And if you needed some fuel, the easiest thing to do is if you drink juice, or better yet, to eat the whole fruit, especially a juicy fruit, not necessarily dates, but something like watermelon or cantaloupe, something like that, that basically is turned into, you know, it's broken apart instantly. But if you eat before you work out, aren't you just burning off the glycogen? And then if you really want to burn fat, isn't it better to not eat? Yeah, some people you work just out? can't work out without the fullness in their stomach. Really? I, I think it's strange, but they I do. Can't. I can't. I, I get nauseous. I've had clients that I was running with on stairs, and I warned them ahead of time whatever you do, please don't eat before this workout. And, you know, after about six or seven minutes That's of running, psh, they're, you know, four feet of vomits coming out of the mouth. Yeah. And I asked them, did you eat beforehand? They said, oh yeah. Well, for yoga and meditation, they recommend you don't eat beforehand. Yeah, it's an individual thing, but uh, generally I, I don't, if, especially if you're trying to lose weight, generally empty stomach I think is best. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
Are there any more exercise questions? Because if not, I want to just ask you something. I don't know if you saw, there have been lots of posts lately, but I wondered to have your thoughts. Recently, somebody posted uh, that on weigh-in Wednesday, they gained 2.5 pounds. This is somebody in our group. And I'm like, we don't have a weigh-in yeah, Wednesday. Yeah, I, I, I've never seen that. And, and I was like, like did like, something what? start without me knowing I know, I'm about like, it? what program are you yeah. on? This is Weight Loss Wednesday, yeah. the name of the show. But in Ultimate Weight Loss, we don't recommend you weigh yourself. Now, there's a caveat. If somebody is insistent on weighing themselves, I, I say to what Dr. Lyle says, which is once a month is reasonable. Mm -hmm. JP says not at no, all. I don't understand. I, I've said it But that's not long. Ultimate Weight Loss. In our group, we don't weigh and measure ourselves or our food. If you're following the program, you don't need to weigh yourself. I don't know what weigh-in well, Wednesday even is. Even if you, no matter. No matter what, if you're weighing yourself, I've said it from day one for 20 years, I'm just going to say it again. What exactly are you weighing? Can you tell me when you step on the scale what you gained or what you lost? Because you'd be, you'd, be, you'd be worth millions then. I don't know. You, you, I mean, it's, it's no, I mean, it's, you can't tell. And you can't gain 2.5 pounds of fat in a week. You no. would have had to eat an additional 10,500 calories. So unless you were not following the program and eating... Right. And additional, what's 10,000 divided by seven? I'm so bad at math. But even if somebody overeats on carbs, it's been proven that's more likely to be stored as glycogen as opposed to if you It's very, very fat. difficult to, well, to store excess protein or carbohydrates as fat. But you, you couldn't do it. Not if you're eating to the left and red line. You couldn't do it if you're sequencing the meals the way we teach. Right, and there's, a, there's three the... questions on sequencing coming oh, up. Oh, okay, let's but, get but, to But uh, the, one more thing. I, one of the other posts that, that I saw when I first woke up was uh, we're doing a challenge in March. Those of you that are in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, if you're not, we hope you consider joining. And if you're just watching, we hope you consider sharing this broadcast and subscribing to my YouTube channel, which is Chef AJ, where these are uploaded, uploaded within 24 hours. So in March, we're doing no eating after dinner because none of us think it's a good idea to eat after dinner, especially if you're trying to lose weight. You know, the research done at Northwestern University proved that calories eaten at night, even if within your caloric budget, always get turned to fat. And all the GI doctors I've interviewed said we shouldn't be eating at night just for health reasons, especially if we have reflux and, and sleep problems. There should be a minimum of three hours. They prefer five. So March, we're trying not to, not trying. We are doing kitchen closed. And so somebody posted this morning that they woke up. I think they said at one in the morning, they were nauseous and they, their oh. stomach was gurgling and they had to eat so that they, because otherwise they couldn't go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. So, so they had vegetables, I assume. No, they, I think they had potatoes. But oh. but the thing is, no, they, they actually said they were starving. And I'm thinking, if you ate dinner, how could you be starving? I mean, I, I, I've roomed with people at True North that were fasting for 40 days that were leaner right. than me, and they're not starving. So if you don't eat from like 6 or 7 p.m. till the morning, how are you starving? So what yeah. are your thoughts on this night eating? I mean, is it psychological? Is it just a habit? Yeah. Well, the thing is, if you want to eat at night, my suggestion has always been go ahead and gorge on salads. Yeah, eat vegetables. Eat vegetables, right? for sure. So I've always said that. But yeah, I mean, I think ideally, I'm just saying for me, an ideal day oftentimes is starting eating at noon and finishing at 5 or 6. Yeah. Does it happen all the time? No. But that's kind of ideal because then if you go to bed at 10, and you're done eating, let's say, at 6 or at the latest 7, you've got three hours that your body's able yeah. to digest. When you're sleeping, remember, that, that whole process of sleep in those 7 or 8 hours, there's all these different things that happen. But one of the things that happens is detoxification. Mm -hmm. So you want your body to be working on detoxifying and repairing uh, injuries instead of just going to take all this energy to, to digest digesting food. food. And I don't know how people sleep soundly when they gorge. No, so some bad. do. It's like working really? out. Yeah, wow. Some people can't sleep without eating. But what I'd say, say then, if that's the case, then just try to eat vegetables as best you can. Yeah, that's all. Eat salad. Okay, we have a question about salad. Yeah, um, we love salad. She said, I know that eating a big-ass salad is preferred for weight loss. I like salad, but find myself throwing out more salad than eaten by the end of the week. I eat a lot of other green veggies. Will other greens be just as good for me for weight loss, or is the big salad a day a must? Yeah, no, any greens would be fine. Anything you want to have is fine. But I wonder why they're throwing out salads. They need to, you know, obviously. Then they're not eating enough salads. Yeah, I mean. That's what I would say. Yeah, I'm wondering what they're eating, you know, what are they eating in place of it. As long as it's yeah. greens, it's fine. But if you're just gorging on starches and stuff, for weight loss, it may be an issue. So here's some ideas. I, I believe Christy asked that question. So, you know, you can, in general, raw vegetables are better for weight loss than cooked vegetables. It's a very minor difference in caloric density. Raw vegetables are about 100 calories per pound on average, cooked are about 200. That's very, it's very minor, this, this tweak. But in general, 
the raw vegetables have a greater satiety because the water is in them. Vegetables are mostly water, vitamins, and minerals anyway, but when they're raw, the water is still there. When you cook them, even when you steam them, steaming doesn't lose a lot of water, but when you air fry them or roast them, you're taking out most of the water, yeah. which for some people is good because when people won't eat vegetables at all, Christy, it's a good thing maybe to have them air fry them or roast them because they, they get caramelized, they get delicious. But in general, raw food, unprocessed food is better than weight loss, better for weight loss than cooked food, meaning in, in terms of fruits and vegetables because you're cooking the water out. So one of the things you can do, and this is what I do, is that uh, you want to eat a salad, at least a salad the size of your head, every one every day, preferably every meal. At True North, they have a 24-hour salad bar, and everybody, when I say everybody, everybody that works there like Dr. Goldhammer, one of the 11-inch dinner plates is always salad, every meal, even breakfast. And so if you find you can't eat salad like that, Use, use soup as a dressing. So in other words, when I have days where I feel like, you know, I just didn't get enough salad in, I'll make one of the delicious recipes from the 21 day guide. Like, you know, I don't know, like the butternut squash soup or the creamy curry kabocha squash soup. And I will put it over salad greens. Mm -hmm. Especially a pea soup works really good. Yeah, and, and my, my salads are mostly arugula these days anyway. Oh. It may sound gross. I learned this from wow. Sharon McCray and the cruise. It's actually delicious. So yeah, I feel like, yes, you have to eat, I, I mean, if you have some kind of digestive thing like Crohn's or IBS, there's certain people that can't eat raw vegetables. I'm right. not telling you to ever go against your doctor or your medical conditions, but unless you have a medical condition where you can't eat raw vegetables, then absolutely salad is a must. Salad is probably the most important thing because it's the food lowest in caloric density. It's 100 calories a pound. So I might even prioritize it over cooked vegetables, especially for weight loss. And there's nothing more filling than a salad the size of your head. And the other thing about uh, raw versus cooked is raw takes longer to chew. Mm -hmm. So preferably you'll be, hopefully you'll be eating your meal slower. Your brain will start getting a signal foods coming in. You'll get full faster by all that chewing. Right, because slowness. chewing actually increases satiety. Mm -hmm. And another thing that, believe it or not, increases satiety, which the people that insist on the weighing and measuring for weight loss don't understand is that when our eyes actually see large volumes of food, which is what we eat in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, already we perceive that we are going to be more satisfied than when we're having, you know, seven ounces of vegetables and four ounces of starch. And, you know, yeah, when we four see, ounces of starch. You know, that's, I think, I think the, the most of the weight measuring programs, it's seven ounces of vegetables, four ounces of starch, and six ounces of protein. At which and then oil. Well, of course, the obligatory oil, and they don't mind salt or animal products. They eat less in ounces uh, in in a day than I eat in a meal. It's just, it's Is that seven ounces of green leafy or that, vegetables? It, all, it doesn't matter. Seven ounces of vegetables. That's not what they limit you to per meal. Is that crazy? I mean, that's like a piece of broccoli. I know. I mean, I, eat, idiotic. I eat three pounds before before lunch and they're, yeah. they're eating like 21 ounces for the whole wow. day. It's sad. It's really sad. Well, anybody lose weight on the program where you're not eating enough. Of course. But and that's why, they, that's why they get hungry and gain weight and come back to the shower program. So, so Elaine asked, what are your thoughts on chewing gum, even if it's sugar-free and vegan? You want to start with that? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, well, first of all, let's say we, we would hope if it is gum, if you were chewing it, definitely didn't have NutraSweet or Spartan. Right. That would be a death sentence. And why? Well, I mean, that's more dangerous for you than pure sugar. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, causes, there's been more reports to the FDA about, uh, those types of sugars, the artificial Absolutely. ones, for hallucinogens and you know cognitive. There's issues a book called Sweet Vision. Poison, written mm -hmm. by a biochemist that explains how she was diagnosed with Graves' disease, and then once it was because she was drinking a diet coke every day. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, some people are drinking five, six, seven of those. Oh my a God. Day. We have and then one girl in the UWL. Gum. I don't know if she's still in it. She was drinking twelve a day. Oh my God. So anyway, so go ahead and answer. Well, here's the thing. The first thing I'm going to say, you talked about being vegan. Well, what people don't understand is that. Things cannot be vegan even if they don't have overt animal products. So this is really a good point that people don't understand. If somebody's an ethical vegan like myself and John Pierre, and we hope that you would be as well, you could say, well, you know, I could drink wine because it's made from grapes. It must be vegan. Well, no, it isn't. I mean, unless you particularly buy the brand of alcohol sold by former NBA star John Sally called Vegan Vine, most wine, most alcohol products are not vegan because they're filtered through the bladder of a sturgeon. They use crustacean shells. So even, so you don't go to Trader Joe's and get two buck chuck, it doesn't say vegan. 
but you you Chuck? that's the name of a wine, Charles Shaughnessy. Oh. But the point I'm trying to make is people assume that if there's no overt animal products, because you know, there is no overt animal products in alcohol that is vegan, but it's really right. not. Of course. Same thing Most with sugar. Sheep sugar or coffee can be filtered through animal bones. So people assume because there's no meat, fish, fowl, eggs, or dairy product, it's vegan. Mm -hmm. and the same thing is with gum. What makes gum so chewy? Do you know what it is? I don't. Well, you're going to love this, is lanolin. And it's a byproduct from the sheep industry. Mm -hmm. But so, they do make some vegan gum. Well, I, I agree. But I'm the, yes, you are right. But what I'm trying to say is many people that chew gum, and maybe they're vegans, ethical vegans or not vegans, it's not going to say unless it's vegan gum. And they just assume their gum is vegan because there's no animal products. But, but they don't realize that lanolin is what makes gum so chewy. And where we get lanolin from sheep's wool. And the sheep's, maybe they're not killed, but we don't recommend oh, well, they're, it. They're, they're, they are, well, they are. They're very mistreated. Yeah. So, so, so that's one thing people have to. And know. also, thanks for mentioning lanolin. But a good majority of the vitamin D mm -hmm. that is from lanolin, unless you buy yeah, one that's you buy D, ergo calciferol. Right. Well, no, D three can be both. Right. It used to be only lanolin right. and fish oil, but now they've come out with a vegan version where they use lychee or they also ultra uh, violet on mushrooms. Hmm. So that's a good point. That you a lot of the soy baby formulas that thank goodness don't have the cow milk protein so much healthier but they have not only a vegetable oil but they have lanolin derived yeah. vitamin d right right so but anyways the the idea with gum aj do you want to continue yeah so I, I okay well this i'm first gonna, I, I just want to say one quick thing please i would rather have somebody chewing vegetables all day right like every time i come every single time i've been here <laughs> every single time i just walked in the door yeah. and what's aj doing i was eating a yellow carrot yeah, i mean gigantic like like oh a, a great oh it was, it was like huge <laughs> you have to be like a beaver to eat it so every time i see her she's always chomping on stuff like that yeah. so that would be better if it's feasible to do it at work but right. go ahead. so first i'm going to tell you my personal opinion because as an aries i always do i think it's a nasty habit i don't think it's as disgusting as like smoking for example, which is the most disgusting habit in the world, and or drinking alcohol. But I can't stand being around people that chew gum. Like if I'm at the movies, depends how they chew it. You ever well, see? Well, if they pop it, they snap right. it. It's just it's just really annoying. Okay. So number one, but I went into the medical literature. You guys can do that. You sometimes you have to pay to get certain articles, but if you go to PubMed or Medscape, a lot of them are free because I really wanted to know the science of you know I, I don't to my knowledge Dr. Greger has not done a video on this yet. Yeah. But what I found is uh, in the Journal of Eating Behaviors, a lot of people chew gum especially people with eating disorders. It's very common people with anorexia and bulimia mm -hmm. chew it because they want some flavor, they want to chew, but they don't want any calories. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're doing it for that, it completely will backfire. Especially if the gum is has certain flavors like mint because what it, what the research in the Journal of Eating Behavior says that the you actually reduce your intake of healthy fruit like a healthy food like fruit and vegetables when you chew gum and you eat more junk food like potato chips and candy. They believe that the possible explanation for this is that the certain flavors in gum like mint actually then will give fruits and vegetables a bitter taste. So mm. that's one reason like that. The other problem with chewing gum is especially people with sensitive GI tracts like me, it contributes to irritable bowel syndrome, it contributes to bloating, it contributes to TMJ. And that's if a it, big one. Yeah. Job problem. Oh yeah. And if it's made with any of the sugar alcohols, mannitol, xylitol, sorbitol, or erythritol, it usually causes diarrhea. Well, and be very careful that your dogs or cats, especially your dogs, never get a hold of your gum because then they have to go to the vet and okay. their stomach pump because the right. artificial spur, the, the sugar, like xylitol and things, can kill dogs. Right. Uh, the other thing is, is it can if you have mercury fillings, chewing gum helps release the mercury from the fillings, so that's also a bad thing. But let's talk about it in terms of people that are doing that because they're thinking it's gonna help them lose weight or not have cravings or trying to reduce yeah. their caloric intake. What it said in the medical literature is that in extreme efforts to reduce energy intake, individuals with eating disorders often substitute sugarless chewing gum for food. Physiologically, the act of chewing gum temporarily satisfies hunger pangs, but the effect is short-lived. The act of chewing signals to the body that the food is on its way, except that food never comes, initiating the production of salivary enzymes and gastric acid. Not good at the FGI problems. Yet when food is not provided, these substances are not degraded immediately, and their presence prolongs the feeling of hunger. So again, like using artificial sweeteners, it actually backfires. This feeling triggers a person with an eating disorder to pop another piece of gum into her mouth, hoping to alleviate the discomfort. 
neither chewing gum excessively nor in moderation supports normal eating practices, especially for people with eating disorders. The artificial sweetness and orosensory stimulation provided by sugarless chewing gum does not allow for normal hunger regulation and may disrupt the learned association between food sweetness and caloric density. So I'm well, voting two thumbs up. The down. other thing is that you should be eating. We want you to eat. Right. We want you. We don't want you to have hunger. So we want you to make sure you get some starch in and you get lots of vegetables right. in. So you're not. Yeah. Hungry. So I would say, well, what what need is chewing gum fulfilling yeah. you? You know. I mean, I mean, you could say, you know, unless you're a smoker trying to cover up the bad taste mm -hmm. of you know your breath. Well, I say, you know, I need to know why you're chewing gum. What about people with say an oral fixation yeah. who want to lose weight? What do they do if they chew on a cinnamon stick? Eat, 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 eat a carrot. Yeah, eat, eat celery. Vegetables. Yeah, eat celery. None of us are getting enough vegetables. That's right. In except this for me. Well, me. Except for you. And I get six pounds a day. People. Yeah. People say, oh my God, I ate a half a pound and I'm full. I can't eat anymore. Yeah. Which is actually, we have a question about sequencing, I believe, which is, is I think. But that's a good know. question. That's excellent. Actually, some of that stuff you just mentioned, I didn't know. I didn't yeah, know about well, the lamb on That's what I do. Exactly. You said, when you send your questions in, I go right to the medical literature, like Dr. Gregor. And now I go do it on my bike, like Dr. Gregor. <laughs> but he does it on his treadmill. James wants you to go into detail on sequencing. And we will, but could you read the next two questions? Because we actually had three questions on sequencing, and they're all kind of related. Well, sure. So James wants us to go into it, which we're going to. Okay. Um, Please share, guys. Please share. Amanda said, I usually do veggies for breakfast, then oats with fruit very shortly after veggies for breakfast. About one pound of vegetables, then starch for lunch, but sometimes I will do just starch for lunch, then one pound of veggies before dinner, then starch and fruit. For dessert, not a lot of veggies, Amanda. Somebody's saying it's blurry. I believe. Well, it's not. I can see it. Okay. it it's their technology. Because okay. if it was, it would be blurry. Uh, but wait, uh, how did they? How do they eat vegetables and then they have oatmeal and then fruit? Now I believe she's a goal weight, but that that makes a difference. Oh, I think so. I believe this is. Oh, the okay. One. So she, I believe she's eating a pound of vegetables and then going immediately to oats and fruit for breakfast. Mm -hmm. oh. For lunch, what's she doing? One starch for lunch, but sometimes lunch. only starch for sometimes lunch. Sometimes only starch, okay. Dinner is one pound of veggies before dinner, then starch and fruit for dessert. If this is who I think it is, she's at goal weight, and I think that's absolutely fine. Cool. But What was the question, though? Why does she have to sequence if she's at goal is, weight? Is she asking, is she sequencing, or is this a good example of sequencing? No, she just said, yes, like the order of foods to eat throughout. Maybe it wasn't a question. It Maybe she was sense. responding oh. to James. Okay. Well, you don't need to sequence if she's at goal weight. Right, exactly. No. Um, and then Mira But said, I do anyway because it's just a habit. Uh -huh. It doesn't feel right yeah. to not sequence. And this is a really great question that I see on the boards. Mm -hmm. um, is sequencing for every meal? Salads three times a day? Sometimes at dinner, I just eat a recipe I make from the 21-day guide and no added veggies. So it's never a good idea to not add veggies. Mm -hmm. Well, most of the time it's not. Well, for, for, most our, people, for our people. For most people. Our people. Our people in the United for States. For athletes, it's a different story. Right. Uh, yeah, and for people that are underweight or people that can't shoot. We're is. talking about yeah. people that are trying to lose weight. Yeah. It's never a good idea to not have at least half of your plate by, by visual volume, not by mm -hmm. weight, to be vegetables. And so sequencing is something, if you're trying to lose weight or if you feel like you're not losing weight, you definitely want to sequence every meal. And you could argue that, it's something you could do even when you're at goal weight. I mean, I don't need to lose weight. Dr. Goldhammer doesn't lose weight. But we sequence our meal because you're going to get maximum enjoyment of your food for sequencing. You know, it's really difficult to go back and eat a salad, as delicious as salad mm -hmm. can be when you're hungry, for 100 calories a pound when you've just had that dish I showed you on Sunday, which is the baked double sweet potato uh, strata with the oh, wow. best damn barbecue sauce in the world. Once you eat that, Pretty hard to go back and eat steamed zucchini or even air fried yeah. zucchini for anybody. For anybody, your taste receptors are your taste buds are most sensitive when you're hungry, and that's why a lot of people fight us. Well, I'll eat vegetables later in the day, but I won't eat them for breakfast. No, you won't, or at least you won't eat the amount you need to for health, weight loss, and cravings busting. If you want yeah. to be bulletproof against cravings, because. Even though all eating stimulates the production of dopamine in your brain, the more calorically concentrated the calories, the higher the fat, the more dopamine is released. And so kale or steamed vegetables or even air fried vegetables at 200 calories a pound is only going to release a certain amount of dopamine. Mm -hmm. Once you have those potatoes, rice and beans and fruit, forget it. All veggies are just, you're not going to have any interest in them. And so, you know, I've done experiments because I could, I could eat without sequencing and there are times 
where like, let's say I'm traveling, for example, like on the cruise where I couldn't get any greens and that's when I was using green powders. So I've eaten just starch and you know, I, I do, I don't feel as good. That's for sure. I don't think my skin looks as good, but I notice that when I fool around with that, that I don't eat as many vegetables that right now I eat between four and six pounds of vegetables a day Four at four pounds, actually like eating, them, meaning three pounds. I do about in the morning, usually I have two pounds of zucchini and then a pound of carrots or sometimes the carrots are later and then I'll have my big salad whenever I have it. And then all my recipes have vegetables in them. So there's no recipes in the 21 day guide that don't have some vegetables right. in them, but I don't count that towards my vegetable allotment. But every now and then where I haven't planned or maybe I was out of vegetables, that doesn't happen often, but like let's say I was traveling and I'm out of vegetables and I forgot I was out of vegetables and I'm really hungry and then I go ahead and eat my starch, I just don't eat my vegetables. I mean, then I got to wait again another six hours to get hungry again. Yeah, good point. Yeah, so if you sequence your meal, you're filling up on the most calorie dilute foods first. And so you want to eat your raw vegetables first. If you're able to eat raw vegetables, this is how we do it in True North and the buffet is set up in order of increasing caloric density. And even at the McDougal 10 day program, the foods are set up in order of increasing caloric density. So you always want to start every single meal with a huge raw salad, it's 100 calories a pound. You need as much as you can. And then you want to move on to the cooked vegetables, some steamed greens preferably. They have the most ability to fight the cravings and turn off the hunger switch. So a large serving of steamed vegetables. And then, you're going to be pretty full, but you're still going to want to be satisfied. So then you have some starch, potatoes, rice, or beans. And when I eat that way, I eat, if I don't eat that way, then I will eat four times as many sweet potatoes as if I mm -hmm. have eaten in order of increasing caloric density. I think and, what you're saying is right, especially for weight loss, mm -hmm. for sure. And when people say, oh, you know, I haven't lost weight and they post their three day food journal, I'm seeing almost no vegetables and yeah. almost no salad. And, and so Myra, you're at goal weight, so I don't have a problem with you eating only a pound for breakfast and then moving on to the starch. But I like people to wait. I mean, you should be so full from your vegetables that you can't move on to your starch immediately. You might be able to move on in an hour or maybe 20 minutes, depending on how much you ate. But if you have to eat starch the minute you finish vegetables, you're not eating enough vegetables, in my opinion. There should be, not that they should keep you full for hours, these vegetables are only 100 calories a pound, but it shouldn't be such a small amount of vegetables that you feel hungry right after. And a lot of you are, are eating your starch with your vegetables for breakfast, and I'm not criticizing that because if you're coming from Egg McMuffins, this is a much better thing to eat yeah. a sweet potato and broccoli for breakfast. Yeah. But the problem is, is you're always going to favor the food of a higher caloric density, and when you Listen, I think sweet potatoes and broccoli together are delicious, and I would do that for lunch or dinner, but you start doing that at breakfast, and you're you're not getting enough vegetables in, and people say, oh, I can't eat starch, I gain weight. You don't overeat on starch, you undereat on vegetables. So I don't recommend if you have weight to lose, if you're still having cravings, to mix your starch and vegetables, at least not at the first meal of the day. Your thoughts on sequencing? I think, yeah. I'm the, I'm the king of sequencing. I've said it from day one, so yeah. I believe in it. Now, I do things a little different. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have a lot of times clients do a hot soup. Well, I consider hot soup the same as steamed vegetables. Yeah. That I feel, feel that. I'm blending the vegetables. Right. I feel that in terms of caloric density, the heating and the cooking, so that's absolutely fine. I, they're, they're the same to me, but yeah. they still want to start with a salad or some right. more vegetables. Okay, so big question. I'll try to shorten it big a little. Big one, huh? All right. Diane. Um, she said that she and her husband are long haul truck drivers and they know they have to change their ways. Long story short, she has a brain injury and she lost her cooking and organizational skills, which has been very hard on her. She says, I can't handle anything over three ingredients, which now limits what I do. I get overwhelmed just trying to shop for us on the truck for a week. With changing our eating style, I'm hoping things can be simplified, but I honestly don't know where to start. I have all the books, but retention is not the greatest. How do I simplify this? Thank you. That's great. You're, you're being okay. pro at it. Well, simplify. actually, uh, there's much to be learned from other people in Ultimate Weight Loss because we have, to my knowledge, three people that are long-distance truckers. So if you join the program, I'm sure that they would support you and give you their tips and tricks. There's also a man named Bobby Anderson called the Plant Fuel Trucker. 
haven't heard from him for a while, but I believe he still has an active Facebook page. He was somebody that was quite overweight with many lifestyle diseases and I guess about to go on medication and instead he went on a plant-based diet. He got an instant pot. To my knowledge, all big rigs have some kind of electrical thing and he started cooking healthy meals in his truck, which you can do. Now you're saying you can't retain information to make a recipe from more than three ingredients. Well, we're not fans of recipes. We give people recipes, and I write cookbooks because that's what people seem to want because my name is Chef AJ. Hopefully, I'll maybe go to medical school and change it to Dr. AJ. But the point is, is we want you to eat food, not recipes. So if you can retain three ingredients, why not make a meal of sweet potatoes, mm -hmm. broccoli, and you know, salad, that's three ingredients, or cook up a bunch of sweet potatoes in your Instant Pot beforehand and, and eat those, you, they, you don't need a recipe, yeah. there's nothing more delicious than a sweet potato, sweet potato and sweet potatoes and broccoli, or whatever vegetable you like, or salad, you don't really need a recipe, and even if you can only stick to three ingredients, you don't need a recipe, corn, beans, and over over a bit of greens, yeah. That that's really all you need to eat is, is, is great, you know, I don't know if you were at that conference with me. I think you were. Remember in Indiana, didn't we do something in Indiana mm -hmm. a long yeah, time sure. ago that called Health in the Heartland? Uh -huh. And you you may not remember this because you, you didn't have to show up till you spoke, but I had to make lunch for like 300 people. So we got up at 4 in the morning. We got to the church at 5, and we worked nonstop without a break till almost 1 o'clock. And then they finally fed us. And the people that hired us were farmers. And this was, this was before UWL. This probably was in 2011. And the lunch was because they grew it, some corn that they steamed, corn on the cob, some russet potatoes that they steamed, and corn, potatoes, and, and some, kind of, some kind of vegetable. And there was no sauce. I mean, they, they did have salt and pepper on the table. There was no fancy sauce or recipes. And I think they had some salt-free Ezekiel bread for those that wanted it. But the point is, is at that moment in time, it was literally the best meal I ever had. Because I had been up since four o'clock, standing on my feet for like eight hours, working really hard, and it was like delicious, and I couldn't believe this was pre UWL how good whole natural food, unadulterated, unadorned, could yeah. taste. And so the thing is, is if you follow the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, if you get off all the sofas, the sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, and salt, whole food tastes amazing. You don't need all the bells and whistles. Well, Shada had been sending me a burger recipe forever, a bean burger. Mm -hmm. And she would always send it to me because I'd ask her to send it. And every time I would look at those ingredients, I said, do people actually take all this time and then all these ingredients and spices and make it up and then cook however you're supposed to cook it? I thought, my God, I can't people believe people do this. I, it's, I don't do it very often, and I keep them in the freezer for company. Yeah, you it's remember delicious. those burgers. Yeah, it's, they're delicious. You get but them but the thing is, is that in the, in the mastery, we have ultimate weight loss, and then there's mastery. One of the key components we talk about in mastery is simplify your eating. Just make it simple. You don't need complicated recipes. So actually, you're at an advantage, um, actually, if, yeah. if, she, if she can only deal with three ingredients. That's yeah. better for oh you. Oh, my God. That's that, wonderful. That it is. You know, it, um, some of you have seen me give this lecture when I speak on the circuit. It's called the Chef AJ's Ten Commandments to Overcoming Your Weight Loss Obstacles. And the number one commandment is thou shalt eat simply. Yeah. Especially if you have food addictions and especially if you want to lose weight. There's a notion called sensory specific satiety. The more choices you allow yourself at every meal, the more you're going to the eat. The buffet effect. Oh, my God. Exactly. So and we were just interviewed um, on, on a podcast. Right. And they asked us what were our three, like, go-to foods. Mm -hmm. And remember, I, I know I said beans. I said sweet potatoes and kale. Right, and I think I said sweet potatoes, broccoli, and I can't remember my third. Because you'll eat beans. Uh -huh, yeah, but I, I must have said something good. Yeah, so, but so the point is, is though you get a couple good starches and a couple uh, servings of vegetables, and you're good yeah. to go. Yeah, don't, you know, don't, if another vegan, listen, I'm thrilled that so many talented chefs are writing vegan cookbooks. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, but the point is, if there was never another vegan recipe written, mm -hmm. there already are enough recipes yeah for us to make for the rest of our lives. You know, that's the, if you're a food addict, stop chasing recipes, learn to eat food, and it will start tasting delicious. And, and be hungry. If you're hungry, oh, yeah. anything that's that tastes That's the trick, good. that's right. Even, mm -hmm. yep, absolutely. Even vegetables, that's why we have you eat them in the morning and eat them by themselves. You really can train yourself to prefer the taste of healthy food. True. So Nicole really needs help. She said, every time I think that I'm doing well and going to be able to do this, I fall off and I binge. I was hoping you would have a suggestion for me. I was addicted to Dr. Pepper, salt, sugar, oil, processed junk, and sometimes don't feel like doing the prep and cooking and other times don't want to eat the healthier food. 
I have been tracking and paying attention to why I fell off and reminding myself why I want to eat this way. I have a clean environment, but about once a week I binge still. How much is it to stay with you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I can relate because I used to go to Dr. Pepper every day yeah. for help. He should be uh, disbarred. Uh, you know, it's, first of all, the first advice we give you is to join Ultimate Weight Loss. I Absolutely. know for a fact she's not in it because well, she needs support. this came in. Yeah, because so, you need support. There's so many people in education. In there. Yeah. All our videos. So sure. that's number one. You can't live with me right now. I'm hoping to create a life so that when I do move out of this very small apartment in Los Angeles, that I'll have either a casitas or a guest house where people can live with me so that I can do one on one and really, really do an immersion into how to do this. I, I, I did have one person come as a pilot program, but this was somebody I knew that was a right. friend. I, I No offense, I mean, I'm not going to shrink or just coming to my house, but it will be probably the same price as going to True North or similar. I'm not trying to gouge people, but it, but you would have me 24 hours a day, so it's going to be costly as opposed to the modest fee of joining the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. So the first thing I have to say is binge eating disorder or bulimia, regardless of how infrequently or frequently you do it, is a psychological disorder, and it needs psychological treatment. It doesn't need a diet, and it certainly doesn't need a weight loss diet. Now, once a month, I interview Dr. Doug Lyle on my other show, Healthy Living Live, and I'm hoping that either this month or next month, he will talk specifically about binging. People that do not have a history of discordant eating, dieting, anorexia, people, it's not a natural thing to binge. You never go anywhere in the world, especially where food is scarce, where people binge. It's always a result of having restricted and having dieted, and mostly a restriction of starch. And so one of the things that Dr. Lyle says is when you stop restricting starch, which you don't have to do on the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, assume you've eaten your veggies first, and you have enough starch and enough satiety, and you finally have satisfied your hunger drive, it tends to dial it down. But for some people, that's not enough, which is why we recommend counseling or therapy, but with somebody that's in the plant-based world that knows what they're doing with this disorder. And the only two people I can recommend are both psychologists. One is Dr. Doug Lyle, and his website is esteemdynamics.org. He's very affordable, $75 for 30 minutes. You can even call into his live radio show Wednesday night and ask him a question if you can't afford the $75. And then the other person would be Dr. Carrie Saunders, another plant-based psychologist. These would be the only two people I recommend. But it also helps when you have support for this disease and joining DWL will help. And your turn. Uh, no, but I think you covered it all. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, so, you know, um, have you had success with any of your clients with binging? I mean, pre, you know, because we've only worked together for six years. Was this something that you saw a lot of? Because it seems to be a primarily female problem. There yeah. are men that do it, but it's of more course. of a female problem. But most of the work that I was doing with them to help them was on an emotional base level. Mm -hmm. Because that's the core of what's happening. Right. So you get reach the core, you can get to it. But I think the sequencing really helps. Right. The sequencing is really, really key. The, and the, the simple things that we talk about, and I've talked about this forever, and people just kind of let it go over their head, are the vision boards, mm -hmm. the essential oils, yep. you know, the meditation, getting your cortisol level down, but being a, being a, having this calm, steady brain where it's not you're having it not bipolar highs and lows. So it's all the basic stuff that we teach in the program, right. and whatever our program costs, I don't even know what it costs. It's one forty nine. One forty nine. That's feet. about the price of a hotel room for a night. Less. Less than it's a hotel room. In LA. So you're getting right. So you're getting our entire program. But the thing you're getting that I don't think anybody understands. We need to let people know this. Yeah. The boards that we have are completely free for now. They're mm -hmm. not going to be free no, forever. We're going to have a, a subscription. Yeah, we're going to have subscription. So. Join now. I mean, it's 100% free, the boards. We're just offering them as and a And that's all we do all day is check yeah. them and answer your questions. Yeah. And like we're doing here for you now. Well, and also, not only that, better than AJ and I are the, the people like the, you the lady. You glean from the experience of the people that went before you. Well, the lady who was talking about the truck drivers, mm -hmm. you know, that we have three or four people yeah, who have Yeah, we have at least three that I know yeah. of that are So they're going to give you their experience right. better than we can. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. so join the program. You know, when I asked Dr. Goldhammer about binging, one of the things he said is that uh, people – you know, there are people that are overweight or obese that don't binge. There really are. And and it's not that they don't care that they're overweight, but they don't they don't binge. They just obviously eat either too much or the wrong food to, mm -hmm. to get them to be a, a higher weight. But Dr. Goldhammer says the thing with binging is that people want the ability to eat large volumes of food, mm -hmm. but yet not be overweight. Well, that's called the Ultimate Weight yeah. Loss Program. That's, that's <laughs> because I do. eat to 10 pounds of food a day, and I don't think it's binging. I, I've never uh, seen anyone eat as much as you. Thank you. And then be as thin as you. Thank you. Well, actually, I've seen two people, and they're both thinner. Sharon McRae is thinner than me and eats more than me, and Caroline Miller is thinner than Sharon McRae and eats more than <laughs> her. So when you understand 
that one of the things Dr. Goldhammer said that I said in last week's episode, the top 10 things I learned from Dr. Goldhammer, he's always said, show me an overweight person and I will show you someone who is unwilling to eat enough raw salad and steamed vegetables. I think it's one of the best quotes in history. Absolutely. For sure. And if when you're eating a salad, your coworkers and your family members don't think it's enough to feed a family of eight, you're not eating enough. Yeah. I think though the question, I mean, it's an excellent question, but I think she has to understand that it's a psychological yes. issue going on. Right. Forget the food for now. Exactly. Yeah. You got to deal with the emotional aspect. Yeah. But don't restrict because we have a question actually coming oh. up. I think about going to True North if you have oh, okay. it. Will it cause me to binge? I think that's the next question. Yep. So Julie wants to know your opinion on medically supervised water only fasting at True North for food addiction specifically. She'll get all the medical questions answered by Dr. G on her free consult during her free consult, but she wants to know your opinion on it. She knows you have suggested it for other addictions, but do you think it does the same for food addiction or could it trigger binge eating when refeeding? I've been with UWL for one and a half years and I have been eating mostly clean during that time. Don't know how she defines mostly clean, but by mostly, I mean that I had ups and downs, but mostly ups lately. Okay. I'm still going, never quitting. Thank you. Would you like to go first? Uh, no, you go ahead. Okay. So, uh, by the way, everyone could get a free consult with Dr. Ellen Goldhammer simply by going to the website, which is healthpromoting.com, filling out the patient intake questionnaire. He cannot talk to you on the phone free for 20 minutes until he has your medical history in front of you, and he's happy to give you that free consult, tell him AJ sent you, so that you can know if True North is right for you. And even if you're unable to undergo a medically supervised therapeutic water-only fast or juice fast, there's still much benefit to going to True North for many reasons, because I've been there a bunch and I've never fasted. So Julie, I personally, and so do the eating disorder specialists, do not recommend fasting for anyone that has an active eating disorder, like anorexia, bulimia, or mixed, or has had it in the past, even if it's in the long ago past, that's number one. So I don't know if you've had that because you're saying, well, the will the restriction cause me to binge? Well, if you don't have that in your history binging, I don't think a fast will necessarily cause you to binge. If you've never binged before, I don't see any evidence to show that the 10,000 people that have fasted in True North then end up binging. I mean, lots of people, thin people like Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Campbell, they fasted. They didn't end up binging afterwards. They were fasting for medical conditions. So that's number one. If you've ever had any binging, then I would personally say no. The problem is a lot of people don't disclose it. I'll tell you the names of these people afterwards, but JP and I have had clients that are still binging, that have a history of bulimia. They go to True North and they don't disclose this to Dr. Lyle or Dr. Goldhammer and they fast because they gain some weight or whatever from not following the program, not from not weighing yourself. You don't gain weight from not using the scale. You gain weight from not following the program. And then it's made their eating disorder worse. You don't fast to lose weight. You will lose weight fasting about a pound a day, but you gain half of that back immediately the minute you start refeeding. Julie, if you like the way the ultimate weight loss food tastes, then there's really no reason to go to True North and fast. There's still a reason to go to True North for the education, for the community, for eating the cleanest food possible. The thing that fasting does for people that are overweight or even people that are not overweight but food addicted is it causes taste neural adaptation to happen quicker. So if you can't eat sofas free food, sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt free food without choking it down or you just won't eat it at all, Fasting causes taste neuroadaption to happen much quicker in a matter of days or a week or as opposed to eating food without. It could take 30 days or longer. So that's the reason to do it, not to lose weight, but to taste neuroadapt. So since you're an ultimate weight loss, we can talk about this more on that thread, and I'm happy to answer your questions. I personally think there's a lot of benefit going to True North, even if you don't fast. And the best time to go when you're not fasting is the holidays, because I'm there the last 10 days of every year with Charles and Bailey and a bunch of you don't. Ellers. But if you are at all concerned that it could cause you to binge, that's some little voice in you telling you, maybe I shouldn't do this. So either don't do it or maybe have a session with Dr. Lyle asking him if it's right for you, because that would be the worst thing to, not the worst thing, one of the worst things is to go there to, to get treatment and then end up worse. So I don't recommend it for people that have any history of discordant eating, especially bulimia, especially anorexia, even in the past. Uh, there's other ways to, to neuro adapt at home. This is just a quicker way. So, when also, if she's on the board, somebody's been, people have been asking a lot of questions about weight loss, weight loss, weight loss, weight loss, weight loss. That's all they've been asking. Mm -hmm. 
And I was like, well, if you just want to lose weight, and I said it in a joking way, just go to True North and fast. Mm -hmm. But that's not, that's weight. Yeah. And they weren't getting that it was kind of a joke, I was saying. But you're going to gain that weight back Mm as a good portion of it's going to be water weight. And, of course, when you start eating again. So it's like follow this program, and this program will get you where you need to be. I I don't really know anybody who's followed the program completely that said, oh, it didn't work. Every, so far, has yeah. Happened. Everybody look at BJ. She said she joined the program and then she wasn't following it for two years. Yeah. And it wasn't until she started following the but program. But she never blamed the program. No, she wasn't following. It. No, no. So but, thank you. But it wasn't until she started following the program as we designed it that she said she got results. Right. Well, that's the idea. I mean, it's it's kind of like going into your car and taking the key and sticking it in the glove compartment and it doesn't start. It, you're not following what the way it's designed. It's supposed to put it in the ignition. Right. So if you follow it the way we ask you to do it, it should work. And here's the thing, it's not just about weight loss, though. So your arteries should open up, your, your cognitive ability should improve, your mood should improve, you know, everything should get better. Weight loss or fat loss will eventually That's happen. a side effect, guys. Yeah, it's just a else. side effect. Yeah, you exactly. treat the food addiction, you treat the underlying problems, and Absolutely. the weight comes off. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so a woman wrote in and said, my coworker who has lost 60 pounds on UW Well and kept it off for over two years is now trying to convince me to join the program. I see what she eats every day for breakfast and lunch, and while it seems very healthy, I question if this way of eating is sustainable and will lead to feelings of deprivation. You better go on now. I'm going to go first because then I want to go get the soup and show it, and then you'll maybe talk until I get back. The first thing is, is don't let anybody convince you of anything, even joining my program. You know, there's an old saying, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So join it because you want to join it not because somebody coerces you or bribes you or court orders you to do it. That's number Mm -hmm. one, because that would be a disaster. We've had people buy this program for loved ones, well-meaning, and Mm -hmm. they have never thrived in it because it has to be your decision to get healthy. So that's number one. And so you're saying that you're worried to leave to deprivation and unsustainability. So Mm -hmm. those are two different things, in my opinion. So I don't know you, because you're not in UWL, so I don't know your history, but... Whenever somebody says to me, if I ate this way, I would feel deprived, I know that they're a food addict. Mm-hmm. Because people that aren't food addicts don't use that exact word. Because what does she mean she'd be deprived of Meaning what? Of the foods exactly. that are addictive. So, yeah. so, 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 for example, if I said, okay, this is the secret to weight loss, guys, you know, we're just going to not eat Savoy cabbage. We found out that if you don't eat this, you'll lose weight. You won't say, God, I'm going to really be deprived. If I can't eat Savoy cabbage, I'm going to crave Savoy cabbage. No, that means that you're addicted because what I think for people that are saying deprivation is what they're talking about is withdrawal. So, in other words, if you can't have sugar or oil or flour, alcohol or salt or animal products, you feel deprived. But what you're really feeling is withdrawal. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. And, and because if these aren't addictive substances, you're not going to feel deprived. I mean, when I found out I was allergic to soy, I mean, you know, I liked soy. I had a great recipe, page 100 and unprocessed. My lasagna it was based in soy. I liked it, you know, but, but it wasn't like, oh, my God, this is not sustainable. I'm going to be so, so deprived because... And mommy, soybeans, it's not an addictive food. So to me, anytime somebody's worried about deprivation, really what they're worried about is having to go through detoxification and withdrawal. And it's always because they are a food addict and these foods are addictive. And you asked, is it sustainable? Well, here's the good news. It's sustainable as long as you sustain this way of eating. You know, we send our clients to a lot of the plant-based doctors throughout the United States and the ones that are local. There's some ones that work at Kaiser, which is an HMO, and some that do private pay, cash pick basis for vegan patients. And I can't tell you, I must get at least one email a week from one of these doctors that says, you know, I've been a doctor for however long, you know, treating people with obesity and these lifestyle diseases. He was, your people, meaning people in ultimate weight loss, are the only patients I've ever had that actually maintain their weight loss. You can attain weight loss on any program, weighing and measuring, but can you sustain it? And we have people now like Heather, who was in two episodes ago that's lost 300 pounds, Shada down 120 pounds, me 50. But it's not how much weight we've lost, it's that we've been able to maintain this for like five or six years. So as long as you continue doing what you did to lose the weight, it is sustainable. And you know, the other thing is, is it's not just the eating that's sustainable, but it's the joy of having a body that you always dreamed of. You know, I've been fat since the age of five, obese by 11, 160 pounds when I wasn't even five feet tall. I couldn't even shop in a regular store my whole life. I didn't want to go to Lane Bryant's, not that there's anything wrong with that store. I'm glad it exists because I think people should look beautiful in every size. But for me, there was a lot of shame involved in having to admit that I was obese. 
because when I was little, I would get fatter every year. And I remember a sales clerk telling my aunt, I lived with my aunt growing up, saying, um, if she gets any fatter, she'll have to shop at Lane. She, they called it Lane Giants, like she was being kind of facetious. Mm -hmm. So in my head from seven years old, I was like, well, I don't want to shop at the, what they're calling the fat lady store. And so I couldn't ever shop at a cute store or a, or a regular store or, you know, I'd have to go to places like Walmart and buy men's, you know, large sweats or, or you know, Walmart had size 16 without having to go to maternity. And so now the biggest thrill I have and this is what is sustainable is the joy of having a smoking hot body at almost 60 years old and perfect skin now, which I didn't have and a stable brain is I go to the mall and I can buy anything I want. I don't, I try it on and take a, take a picture. But I mean, to me, that is sustainable. The joy of healthy living is what is sustainable. Being overweight or obese, I guess it's sustainable if you're sustaining it, but there's no joy there. So yeah. I'm going to go get the soup and let him talk I, about deprivation yeah. and sustainability. Well, you know, I've had clients that, and this is not really funny, but, you know, clients have basically said, if I was to live like you're proposing, I would feel deprived. And they didn't use the word sustain, unsustainable, but they said, I'd feel deprived. And if you ask them, what do you, what would you feel deprived of? I'm not kidding you what they'll say. Heroin, marijuana, alcohol, coffee, tobacco. You know, all these things, those are the things that they feel deprived of. We're always fighting for our addiction. So that's the thing that you have to really take a look at is if you would write down on paper what specifically do you think you'll, you'd be deprived of, I doubt if you would, if it would be really any healthy foods. It'd be all foods that are really addictive. So, right. Yeah. Or, oh, they'll say they're, uh, you know, they'll miss bread or they'll miss sugar. Oh, yeah, right. Well, all everything is addictive. Right. It's not a natural food. So. Right. But that's a good question. But I definitely would think to think about joining, especially if you have a friend who's done well in the program, you can work together. That's even nicer. Anytime you can have a buddy, that's what's really beneficial. The reason why the boards work so good is because you have over 2,000 buddies now that you can ask questions to and relate to. But it is even nicer if you have somebody in your own work environment or your own home or a friend that you can see and go out to dinner with. That That's actually beneficial. Wow, so we're just waiting for the, okay, let me get it straight. We're just waiting for the pressure to release. And then when it does, I'm going to add my vinegar. I'm using apple cider. In the book on process, I call for a spicy pecan vinegar that Dr. Furman sells. Uh, but it's, a lot of people didn't like that I did that. But, so I'm trying to get these products that you can get anywhere. And then I'm going to add my savoy cabbage. Uh, this, you can also garnish this with herbs like fresh basil or fresh Italian parsley. I'm not going to do that right now. This is taking a little yeah, while. No, so, like what? Well, we can give ourselves a facial because, remember, the unit was very, very full. And uh, so we're just kind of killing time right here. We thank you so much for your questions, and we appreciate you sending them in to my website. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh. eatonprocess.com. Absolutely. You know, you certainly can ask questions live, but what you have to understand is that the way this technology works Facebook Live Eden or Kenny or myself, which I'm here, we can only see about one and a half, maybe like six or seven words, and some of your questions are longer, and we miss them. So that's why we appreciate when you send them in. And don't forget to come to the Live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference in Vegas, because oh, it's going to yeah. sell out. All right. So this was a comment when you were talking about the sustainability, and um, she must not be in the program because... She doesn't have a clean environment, but right. Her name is Tabitha, and she said, I oh, "Oh wait, is it? I think it might be. Yeah, there is a Tabitha in our program. Okay, perhaps she is then. Yeah, she says I struggle with foods that I have in my house for my kids, like Earth Balance bread and breads. So Earth Balance is pretty much pre pure oil, well, and, and also it's, it's, and palm it's, oil. it's palm oil, and that means they're pure. you've got orangutan blood on your hand." and the blood of the Borneo chimps and the Sumatra elephants. If you are going to eat butter, which I don't recommend, at least do Miyoko's Creamery, yeah. because then there is no blood on your hand from the orangutans, the chimps, and the elephants. Please There's do no not eat palm oil. Oh, wow. Please stop eating Earth Balance. So she says, I'm trying to cut out high-fat foods for myself, but it's hard when you have to prepare them for your kids. Yeah, well, don't prepare them for your kids. If your kids are not old enough to prepare them for yourself, have your husband do it. And, uh, well, and kids aren't going to survive without bread and fake butter. Right, I mean, exactly. If they want to eat fat, have them eat whole food fats, like nuts and seeds and avocados and almond butter. Keep those foods. If you can't, if you absolutely cannot get those foods out of your environment, then keep them in a locked food safe. We've showed you this in other episodes. I can run to the back room and get is she it. Is UWL? 
Well, if she, if you are in UWL, um, then you know we talk a lot about having that vision board in the kitchen. Yeah. We talk about if you're preparing foods for somebody, make sure you use your essential oils so then you lose your taste. You're not hungry at all. Yeah. So we talk about all those tricks in the program. And so. read Dr. Furman's book, Fast Food Genocide. Fake butter is not really a healthy food for kids, and, and bread no. Bread is really not necessary. I mean, if somebody was going to have to eat bread, maybe if it was a salt-free Ezekiel, Ezekiel bread yeah. or a sprouted tortilla. Yeah, yeah. But, you're, you know, your kids can eat this way. They might well, need more whole food fat, but don't – please read Fast Food well, well, the other thing is how do you think your kids get to be where you're at? In other words, if you're if you're having some issues now – Good point. Well, then, you know, what, don't you wish you could take a time machine and go back, you know, 10 or 15 years – and then change your diet and lifestyle. So you should give that gift to your kids too, hopefully. So putting in the vinegar, and this is why I like the eight quart because I don't have to make smaller versions of my recipes. You want leftovers. And I, like I said at the beginning, when I'm Yum, using man. Savoy cabbage is, Yay. it's uh, it's hard to explain. If people don't like cabbage, not everybody does because it's bitter. It's almost, a, does. it's almost a cross between lettuce and cabbage. It's delicious. I'm going to yeah. stir it up. Oh, that. man, this looks so good. Oh. And Tabitha's still with us. She says, right. oh, my goodness, I had no idea. Oh, poor Tabitha. Uh, join well, UWL that, and we'll support you, well, for sure join w UWL, Look for sure. That. But I don't know what she meant. She had no idea. But. Probably no idea how unhealthy... Yeah. Well, right. it's it's the way we're all raised. We all right. were there, Tabitha. So yep. believe me, we've all done those things, and it's just mm -hmm. a matter of learning. So, but it is important, gang, that you understand this whole issue. Livingwithharmony.org is my site, and we've talked about palm oil forever. We talked about getting rid of plastic, plastic straws. Don't buy plastic stuff. Use stainless steel and glass. It's the only way we're going to save the planet. And try stopping at the Savoy cabbage soup from unprocessed. Page 136, you can now make it in the pressure cooker. If you haven't gotten this book, please get it. It's my birthday this month. That would be a nice thing for you to do for me. Or just uh, be abstinent of sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt for a whole month in my honor. And animal products. Well, of course, well, we're assuming you're already abstinent of animal products. Why else would you follow me, right? So thank you. It's great to have you back. It's great to have Eden back. And thank you all for watching. Yes. And please share this broadcast now or later by subscribing to my YouTube page, Chef AJ. Both John Pierre and I truly believe you can have both the health and the body that you so richly deserve. Take care, everybody, and see you next week. It never lets me turn. This is like.